our distinguished lecture series in the area of climate change. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Bjorn Stigson. I've had the pleasure uh, of working with him on the Committee on America's Climate Choices at the U.S. National Academies over the last, uh, I guess it's only been about a year and a half, but it, it seems like much longer. Um, Bjorn has had a distinguished career in international business. He was president and CEO of the Flock Group, a global leader in environmental technology, and then executive vice president of AAB, ABD, uh, a global leader in energy and environmental technology. But more to the point, now Bjorn is president of the World Business Council uh, for Sustainable Development. This is a coalition of over 200 leading global corporations. He is an advisor to the most senior levels of the Chinese and Indian governments, to the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, to the Kennedy School at Harvard, to the Clinton Global Initiatives, and to the Global Reporting Initiative. Some changes in the world come from those whose photos we see on the front pages of the papers, those who hold official CEO offices um, and are easily recognized through a Google search or, or just looking at the papers, as I've mentioned. But over my career, I've had the opportunity and privilege to work with a few people who affect change that is often even greater than the headline makers by working quietly behind the scenes, offering new ideas, showing the way forward past obstacles and conflict, exerting the real leadership that then is often attributed to the people at the front of the po podium. Bjorn is one of those people who is quietly but very substantially changing the world. I think when a serious history is written of how we came to co cope with climate change, uh, Bjorn's name will be a frequent entry in that uh, uh, history. Um, and there's no one I know who has a better understanding of what's going on globally, and in some cases a more sobering message for the U.S. Uh, about where we stand in the world situation. And so with that, let me turn it over to Bjorn. Well, good afternoon, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, and uh, Tom, thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, Tom is the reason uh, that I'm here today. He has been pushing me for about uh, a year to uh, come to, uh, to the MSU, and he's been uh, very uh, talking about uh, you and uh, this organization in very glowing terms, and said you absolutely have to come and uh, meet the number of my interesting, uh, knowledgeable colleagues. And uh, I'm only here for a day, but uh, they have been working me hard uh, since early morning, and will continue to work me hard before before I have to leave. And, and actually, I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow morning from uh, uh, Chicago uh, to go to China to continue my discussions with the Chinese. Um, I, th there is one part of my CV that I'm proud to add to what you said as a new thing, because uh, one of the things that I've tried uh, with uh, mixed success, I guess, over the years, is to connect the, the academic world and the business world. Uh, we have been, been trying in different ways. And uh, so I've, I've said I, I have to make a more honest attempt. So uh, I am, uh, since this month, a visiting professor at my old school of business administration in, in Gothenburg. And uh, um, as we are in a car producing state, I'm going to hold the, the, the chair of uh, Asar Gabrielson, who is the founder of Volvo. So, uh, uh, I'm going to work on trying to understand uh, more of the academic uh, world and see what we can do together between the academic world and business. So I'll spend the next uh, 40, 45 minutes uh, trying to uh, tell you a, a story about uh, how I see the world beyond Copenhagen and, and uh, where we are going. And the platform, as you heard uh, Tom mentioning, is the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. You can see a couple of data there. Uh, the market cap of, of these companies that are substantial and the number of employees. Uh, this is the structure of the membership per sector. And uh, uh, it's probably not surprising that uh, the energy related sectors are uh, very well represented. But you can see it's a very broad set of sectors that make up our membership. And uh, this is the membership based on where uh, companies are headquartered. Uh, North America, uh, like uh, which we define as NAFTA, has 40 of uh, the 200 uh, uh, members. And uh, we also have another pillar of our uh, structure, which is uh, a regional network with uh, uh, national 
business organizations, national partners in 60 countries, primarily in developing countries. So they are normally uh, a national BCSD, a national business council for sustainable development. So that's uh, the WBCSD. And, and what I, I will uh, talk about is, I, I will give you a view of how I see the surrounding world, and I will utilize the work program that we have at the World Business Council to illustrate how business is addressing this. And I will say a few words about uh, the strategic issues that we are grappling with as an organization uh, going forward. But my my storyline uh, here is a story about uh, uh, a world in transition to sustainability, where the, diff the, the pillars of sustainability are changing dramatically. And one of the drivers for this is the growth of population. Uh, we've had growth and we continue to grow. We expect to add a third more people over the next 40 years on the planet. And as they are born in the developing countries primarily, we will be in a situation by 2050 where 85% of the world's population will live in what we today call developing countries. 15% will be North America, Europe, uh, Japan. And the focus of these developing countries is on poverty alleviation in all its aspects, whether it's economic poverty, energy, mobility, water, we could make a much longer list, health and so on, and, and add to that list. Uh, but that's their priority. And at the same time, we are moving into cities. We uh, expect that we will be urbanized to 70% by 2050. And if we look at what that means in absolute terms, it means that we are going to double the number of people living in cities in only 40 years' time. We are going to build as much urban infrastructure in 40 years that we built in the whole history of mankind. And it's primarily going to be in the developing world. There is where the megacities are going to be. And if we, make, if we get this wrong, then we have a real sustainability headache when we come to the middle of the century. And at the moment, what we are building is not very resource and energy efficient. Now, what all of this means is also that uh, that the economic deve uh, development in these deve developing countries will be faster than in the rich world. And already today the GDP is bigger in the emerging economies than in, uh, in the OECD countries. And only in 15 years time we expect that two-thirds of the economic activity in the world will be in emerging economies. That's the world which forms the background against which we have to look at uh, how we go forward and how we address the sustainability issues and, and, and climate change. We have, uh, as uh, the World Business Council, uh, we have, uh, uh, over the last one and a half year, been working on <coughs> excuse me, uh, what, something we call Vision 2050. About 30 of our member companies have been working to look at a business vision up to 2050 uh, of what is the role of business in a future world which is resource and carbon constraint, given what I just said. And the vision that they have formulated for themselves is nine billion people living well and within the limits of the planet. And if we look at what that means, uh, this is a chart that uh, on one axis uh, is trying to portray quality of life, utilizing the United Nations Human Development Index. And on the other, uh, you have the ecological footprint. And what we see is a very clear correlation that as the living standard is increasing, so is the ecological footprint. Um, and uh, the challenge is that there is a space down in the right-hand quadrant there, which, uh, which is, uh, is where we have to be if we're going to be nine billion people living well within the limits of the planet. And the challenge is no country is there today. The only one that touches the corner up there a little bit is Cuba. But apart from that, no country is in that space. Which means that if we are going to get there, there will be a need for an enormous amount of, of innovations and transformation. In this Vision 2050 report that we launched last month, we are talking about what the world could look like in 2050 if it is sustainable. And the report is discussing the pathway to get there. And it's discussing nine elements 
uh, where we need major innovations and transformations to get there. And in particular, it's talking about uh, the next 10 years, what they call in this project, the turbulent teens. Uh, what do we have to do over the next 10 years to be on a pathway to sustainability by 2020? What are the must-haves that we must have over the next uh, 10 years to make that happen? Uh, if we look at uh, what it means uh, now starting to address this, uh, I've uh, indicated the type of changes that the economy, society, the environment are going through and the pressure that this means on the environment. And as we now start to address this, we run up against the first issue, which is mindsets, which is that we don't think alike around the world uh, about sustainability. We've got uh, different values, priorities, based on culture, tradition, religion, and so on. Uh, and not the least, we've got different views on equity. Who has got the right to what development, to what resources, who is responsible for what? And then we come to solutions. And uh, it's business that has uh, the majority of the resources for the solutions, the technologies, uh, the money, the management, uh, the, fun the funding uh, to make this happen. But if we want these solutions to be deployed fast enough, we need a framework, we need institutions and regulations that are efficient. And then you come to the geography. Where do you take action? And actions are primarily within the nation state. That's where you can legislate, that's where, where you can raise resources. Partly in countries like the US, uh, you have also on the regional level with, with states and sometimes uh, cities are strong where actions are being implemented. But there is very little that is implemented on a global level and that's a big misunderstanding sometimes in the debate. Copenhagen is not about implementation. It's about agreeing certain basic principles, certain ambition levels. It's not about implementation. Whatever is agreed on the, on the global level has to be translated into action in, in countries or at some regional level below the country level. But there are issues that must be dealt with on a global uh, basis, climate being one. And there is at this point in time a very big question mark, where will that global leadership come from? What we see at the moment is not very encouraging, whether it's trade, maybe climate, financial system, the UN, and whatever will come out of, of a, a smaller group uh, that can address some of these issues. And the other challenge that we have when we talk about sustainability is that there are very short-term concerns uh, from uh, governments. The economy of my country, but growth, economic growth, public finances, jobs, uh, and unemployment. And there are green elements of the stimulus packages that people have put in place uh, to address this. But there is not clarity that the green growth would solve the problem. That is not yet defined, uh, and uh, even if uh, it's much uh, talked about. And of course, as governments start to think about this, and they start to think about sustainability, they are also having in the back of their minds, not only in the U.S. with the midterm election, but also in other places. How do I get re-elected? What am I supposed to do out of all these things? Uh, and uh, that, that, the answer to that is not a given. But globally, uh, the population is saying uh, governments have to regulate more, generally. Uh, but it's also interesting that when we look at the two extremes, we have on one hand China, where 90-95% of people say, government regulate. And on the other side of, of the scale, we have Japan and the US, where people are saying, don't regulate, leave it to the market. Uh, and it's important to understand that when you then walk into a global discussion, and you have that home front, that you will approach things in a little bit different way, depending upon where you come from. But irrespective of all of this, in my view, the green race is on. It's, about, it's a race between countries about who is going to be the leading supplier of resource efficient technologies and solutions going forward. And uh, the main issue, if you want to win that race, is that you have to transform your home market. 
you have to build competencies and scale in your home market. If you cannot do that, you are not going to be a leading exporter. And uh, the key transformations that you have to deal with are basically these. And I'll, I'll say a few words about these transformations that countries will have to go through, and globally we have to go through. Energy. The energy system will have to be dramatically transformed. Less oil, more renewables, more nuclear, reduce carbon intensity, smart technology, demand side management, new business models for the energy industry, electrification of transportation, energy for development in the developing countries, and some kind of a value for carbon. And I could make the list longer. But I'm just trying to exemplify that the energy system will have to go through dramatic transformation. Another area is, tra is transport that I mentioned. And this is from the IEA's uh, Energy Technology Perspectives Report up to 2050. And what I'm trying to show with this is when you look at the green part of these uh, bars, that's the transport element of the additional investments that are needed to reach the 450 ppm world. The majority of the investments going forward will be on the demand side and it will be about transport which is important to realize when you're in Michigan. And that is basically about a completely new car fleet in the world up to 2050. And a car fleet which looks very different from the car fleet of today. Another of these transformation is around the food. Uh, we had a green revolution in the 60s. And you see we, we, uh, the global harvest yields picked up. But then, and it has continued to improve. But the global population growth is outpacing uh, harvest yields. And on top of that, we have the issues around land use changes, uh, agriculture and forestry. Today, they represent about 30% of all greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a major climate problem. And the major driver for this is livestock. It's uh, cattle, it's beef. That is the major problem. And, and uh, 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 clearing of, of forest land in the tropics to raise cattle or, or uh, grow feedstock uh, is the major uh, source behind deforestation and behind uh, the share of, of climate uh, uh, emissions that can come from, uh, uh, from this. And this will have consequences for food consumption and lifestyles going forward. We have a situation where not only do we not keep pace with a population with harvest yields. We have a change in diets in the developing countries with more meat. When you look at the consequences of this, we have a, a pretty serious uh, challenge. And what's added to that challenge is the water challenge. Uh, we have a certain amount of water, the lower line. We have a certain efficiency improvement in use and using it, but we have a faster growing demand for water. Because of more people, higher living standards, changing diets, the food issue, uh, and uh, uh, we have a gap on water availability that we don't know how to bridge at this point in time. So these are the serious transformations that we have to address, and they are inter interrelated uh, in many ways, and they are further complicated by climate change. Now let me say a few words about how countries are trying to address this. Japan, leader on energy efficient solutions, uh, and uh, that's the most energy efficient economy globally. And they've worked a long time uh, on this. They started in the, after the oil crisis in the 70s. The EU is today the market leader on green technology. They have about 40% market share on, on exports of green technology today. Uh, and they are increasing their R&D spending quite a lot. But it is a question mark if it's still sufficient, and it's also a question mark if the EU is building its home market to, to bring technologies fast enough to maintain uh, this position. And they are being challenged. One, by, by the US. The new administration wants, as far as I can understand, uh, the US to utilize its innovation capacity and be the world leader on green technologies. But it's a concern in the U in the US business uh, community that uh, uh, this will not transform into jobs and manufacturing capacity in the US, that these innovations will go abroad, as happened uh, with some of the IT uh, 
uh, innovations. The uh, CEO of General Electric expressed it earlier this month. Let's not take this growth industry and give it to every other country in the world but the US. And you've got China. They want to be the leading exporter of green technologies. And this is a key component of the next five year plan. And uh, a few weeks ago, the Prime Minister Wen Jiabao, speaking at the People's Congress, said, we urgently need to transform the pattern of economic development. We will work hard to develop low carbon technologies. And there have been statements later on that have further uh, enhanced that. And interestingly, the same day, John Doerr, the uh, venture capital guru from uh, uh, Silicon Valley, was saying, my conclusion, looking at this, is China is winning, the green race, that is. The results of their policies are staggering. And actually, yesterday, coming here, I read USA Today, and it was a big article on the first page and, and second page uh, on this, and it was uh, an interview also in this article uh, by, uh, with Todd Stern, the, the climate envoy uh, from the State Department, and he was saying the same thing. He was saying, China has passed us. If we don't get our act together as America, getting policies in place, drive the domestic market, China will continue to, uh, to pull uh, uh, away from us and, and, and be the leader on this. Then we've got India, and India is now also starting to look at, at green solutions. And uh, what they are focused on is the poor part of the population. And they have, as you know, many hundreds of millions of people. And they are looking at utilizing that mass to, de to uh, develop low-cost innovative solutions. Uh, that can be then solutions for the rest of the world as well, uh, toward the poor parts of the population. So, this is the world that I see, what I talked about first, the enormous growth and what the consequences of that, and a world which is turning green. And it's a green race. Uh, and the race has started, people are off the starting blocks, the race is going on, and I'm, I'm standing on the sideline as a promoter of sustainable development, and I'm applauding uh, good performance, and may the best man win. And uh, uh, one of the things that I'm... Uh, try to stimulate, uh, also in connection with America's climate choices, is making America aware that this is what is happening in the world, and that you have to get your act together if you want to be uh, a leader uh, in, in tomorrow's export markets, because it will be about green technologies. The world is going to be resource and carbon constrained, that's a given. And uh, the focus will be on solutions that can make the world function, where we'll, people can live well within the limits of the planet. Now, as business, we have a role in, in, in this. And I think it was very well expressed by Eva de Boer, the head of the Climate Secretariat, when he announced his resignation a few weeks ago. He said, while governments provide the necessary policy framework, the real solutions must come from business. Copenhagen did not provide us with a clear agreement in legal terms. But the political commitment and sense of direction towards the low emissions world are overwhelming. This calls for new partnerships with the business sector, and I have no chance to make that, to help make this happen. I think he expresses it very well. The challenge that we have uh, from business is to be, cl be clear on what we can contribute and the support we need in different ways. And unfortunately, the voice from business is sometimes pretty... Uh, fragmented or not united uh, and uh, as a businessman I can clearly say that this is also the case from my business colleagues in this country that uh, it's not easy to be a government and, and understand where is the majority of the business community when you look at the, uh, the different messages coming. The business has to be a much, do a much better job in, in getting a coherent message across. Now let me turn to the WBCSD to the World Business Council and our work program to exemplify for you a little bit of what we are trying to do to address what I've now talked about, what we're working on. And we've got four focus areas. The business role, <coughs> development, energy and climate and ecosystems. Uh, we have got, and these are platforms for thought leadership, uh, broad policy messages. And then we've got projects that go very deep into the value chain of different sectors. 
and engaging the leading actors in these sectors. And then we have a new part of this, which we call system solutions. Because we are seeing, we, if we want to come to a sustainable world, we have to look at holistic solutions in a number of areas. And I will uh, talk about some of these uh, parts of, of uh, this work program, not all, but as examples. And I'm starting with energy and climate. The basic platform for thinking about it uh, is what uh, one can illustrate with this. It's also from the International Energy Agency, their energy technology perspectives. The top line, the business as usual. The gap one, existing technologies. It's about the deployment. And gap two, it's about developing some new technologies that we don't have, breakthrough technologies. Carbon capture and storage, next generation of nuclear, battery technology, and a number of things that are needed. But we can come a long way with what we already have if we just start implementing it uh, efficiently. And the key uh, issue uh, is about energy efficiency. Um, and uh, this is from another International Energy Agency publication looking up to 2030, the World Energy Outlook uh, that came out of last year. And 57% of all carbon emission reductions up to 2030 is about efficiency. And the majority of all the solutions for that we have, it's about deploying it. And partly that deployment has to be done in cooperation between governments and business, because market forces alone won't do it in a number of areas. The big parts of this are buildings and transportation. Now we have a climate agreement, we are not doing very well. Uh, countries are not reaching the Kyoto targets. There are three countries that uh, are doing better, but it's all by, by coincidence or accident. Uh, Russia because the fall of the Soviet Empire. Germany because they got East Germany into the baseline, and, and the UK because they found much more gas than they thought, so they could uh, get out of coal. But apart from that, we are not doing very well towards uh, uh, the Kyoto targets. And the US, you see the, the emissions trend. Now, we went to Copenhagen to negotiate the New Deal, and these are my takeaways from Copenhagen. That was the end of the old ways of negotiating internationally. And at the same time, it wasn't the end of dealing with climate change. Climate change has gone up on the agenda, on, on the national agenda, as an energy issue, as a trade issue, as a development issue, as a national security issue after that. We got an accord from Copenhagen, uh, which is pretty uh, round in its language, I guess, is a good word. It's a ladder of intent. Uh, and it's got certain things in it about uh, maximum two degrees, global warming, pledges from countries, reporting, and funding to the developing world. Part of the agreement in, in Copenhagen was that countries should state by the end of January their pledges, what they're supposed to do. And the green line in the middle here is an interpretation of what they have been saying. The trend line that you have to be on to reach that two degrees centigrade is the lower line to a 450 ppm world. So we are, with these pledges, pretty far from uh, uh, that uh, trend line. And, uh, but it's not difficult to, it's difficult to see what countries are really saying. Because at different base years, some of these targets are, are absolute, some are intensity, some include offsets, and uh, uh, it is really very difficult to make sense of uh, what are people really uh, committing to. Now, why do we have this complicated situation? I would say that these are, in my view, the seven key stumbling blocks in the international climate negotiations. Climate change is not a priority for all. We don't agree whose carbon it is up there, a historical versus future carbon, who's going to pay for it, what type of commitments are countries willing to accept, as you, you saw the targets, and which is partly connected to national sovereignty? There is no agreement about exactly what the support to the developing countries means. There is a $100 billion number mentioned in, in the Copenhagen Accord from 2020, but there is no specificity where it's going to come from. And governments are saying, we're going to provide some of it, and then we expect business that's going to provide the majority of this. Well. Business is not in, into development aid 
diff businesses into doing business. So this is not at all clear to me how this is going to function. Competitive concerns, uh, the question of climate science. Um, and uh, Tom and I know that it is a big debate in the, in, in the science community. And, and uh, I know that many uh, are saying, well, this, this was small stuff. It was only a few things that went wrong. Well, it, it has had a lot of impact on people thinking. Uh, it's my perception and when I look at, at different surveys. And then we have the, fa the fact that the U.S. does not have a legislation domestically. And as long as the U.S. does not have a domestic uh, climate legislation, there is not going to be a global climate deal. That's just a showstopper. Uh, the rest of the world is not going to move forward if the U.S. does not have a climate regulation. And uh, this was something that uh, I got from one of your sister uh, organizations from Yale based on a, on a survey. And it seems like uh, the mentality in the U.S. today is uh, substantially less inclined to support uh, regulation, uh, uh, and, uh, nationwide climate regulation. Everyone say we need clean energy, more or less, and the majority supports EPA regulating. Uh, but a climate regulation deal uh, has got uh, limited support, it seems. Now, what will the world look like going forward? Some kind of bottom-up pledges, I believe. Some kind of a global, global umbrella agreement based on the Copenhagen Accord elements and some other things. And the transformations uh, somehow uh, uh, getting the green rays and, and these transformations uh, getting into, um, uh, ha having an impact on how we address this. But um, it, it's very hard for me to see that we will have an extensive uh, uh, global agreement. And most likely it could look like, like this, uh, which is actually also from the International Energy Agency. National plans, uh, some kind of international sector approaches, uh, and cap and trade for some sectors in the OECD countries. That is probably uh, a likely uh, architecture uh, going forward. Given this discussion about sectoral approaches, we are doing a lot of work to see if this can address competition concerns across country borders. And I mentioned a few uh, such projects and some are doing in partnership with others. And the International Energy Agency has got the task to develop technology roadmaps for 17 key technologies, industry sectors, and, and we are working with them on that. Uh, the first one that's been produced uh, uh, was uh, uh, for cement, which we launched in December between us and, and the and, and IA. And it's looking out to 2050. What are the technology options for the cement industry if cement is going to contribute to a 450 ppm world? And we are working on other such technology programs. Electricity utilities, another of our projects, where we have also developed a set of reports and a roadmap uh, for this, and we are looking now into a specific technology roadmap uh, for that sector. The uh, building sector. <coughs> Buildings represent about 50% of world energy use directly and indirectly. And uh, uh, there is a substantial uh, potential to reduce emissions and energy use. Uh, we, we have a major uh, database for the sector. And we're saying we can cut building emissions in half by 2050 at the cost of $25 per ton of CO2, which is a small number relative to a number of other options. And we had the Peterson Institute in Washington to review this and write a report, which they've done, and they confirm uh, that this is their uh, understanding as well, with the with the reasonable assumptions around policies and so on, this can be done. This is a major potential. Uh, we are, as the World Business Council, trying to uh, give a a business perspective on these climate issues in dialogues in different ways with governments, working with partners, looking at specific inputs, uh, advisory uh, roles to governments uh, like the America's Climate Choices. And we also have a very 
special uh, job going at this point in time. Uh, we have a contract by, with the EU. The EU has asked us to, by June, come with a formal proposal for how business should be more formally integrated into the climate negotiations. And uh, we clearly believe that if the leading global business is not part of the discussion in the climate negotiations, this is never going to work. I don't believe we're going to see a Copenhagen 193 government uh, negotiation, but it has to be a discussion between the leading countries, but that discussion has to include the leading part of the global business community, otherwise it's not going to work. And we're also providing tools and, uh, for this, and uh, one of the things I wanted to mention is our greenhouse gas protocol that we've developed over the last 10 years with the World Resources Institute. Uh, I suspected that we could end up where we are today on climate. And what I was concerned about was that if a ton of carbon was not then defined in the same way in different parts of the world, so that an American ton of carbon looked different from a Japanese ton of carbon or a Chinese ton of carbon, we would have no possibility to optimize this, and especially not for global companies. So we've been able with the standard to basically create the standard. It's also an ISO standard, and we are, we are gradually creating new modules uh, for this. So that was my second part, and a few words about the future world and, and how we see ourselves. Uh, and uh, we have a discussion ongoing about 2020, the, pa uh, the milestone to a, su a sustainable world. And I mentioned that in our business role uh, project, they've looked a lot at the turbulent teams. And we are now discussing what is it that we have to do as a leading platform for global companies over the next 10 years uh, uh, to deal with this. And what consequences uh, uh, will, will it have? Uh, what solutions can we propose? And what will the consequences be for our work program? And I would like to point at uh, um, a few things uh, that we see that is going to be important. System solutions. We have two projects at the moment, one on urban infrastructure uh, and one on sustainable value chains. And the sustainable value chains project, the first phase is focused on fast moving consumer goods, basically food. And it's co-chaired by Unilever and, and uh, Coca-Cola. But there are then other uh, system solutions that we're also considering. The second strategic issue is the question of consumption. We won't be able to make this world sustainable just by efficiency and technology. Now, there will have to be consequences for lifestyles and consumption patterns. And that won't happen by markets alone. It will have to also include government regulations. Like, for instance, the a fuel efficiency standards for cars, building codes on, on energy efficiency, a number of other issues. It won't happen without it. It is extremely difficult for business to advocate that we should, uh, that our customers should buy less of our products. Uh, it is not easier for uh, governments to put hardship on their voters. But unless we find a way of addressing this in some way or another, we are not going to have a sustainable world. It's going to be a tough issue. And I know it's going to be a very tough issue in this country. The other thing, and that connects to you as a, as a leading academic institution, we don't have the people that we need to, in, uh, to implement these solutions. There is a lack of talent and skills on all levels, from management down to installers and, uh, uh, and service people. There is an enormous educational need to develop uh, uh, the skills, talent, that we need to make this happen. And the fourth strategic issue that we are uh, struggling with is the role of the financial sector. The fun uh, and, I mean, to put it simple, it is the financial sector a help or a hindrance in creating a sustainable world? If I would uh, put my own personal view right now, it's a hindrance, it's not a help. Uh, and, and it's not clear what the role of the financial sector is. Is it a societal service or is it a platform to be rich those that are involved? 
Um, and, and one of the key issues that we have uh, uh, connected to this is how we measure things in, in the economy. Something might be very profitable from a societal perspective and have a reasonable risk uh, and, and return balance, but it might not be sufficiently profitable on a risk and return basis for an individual company or for an individual person. And then it is going to be very difficult to make it happen. I can take an example from buildings that I mentioned. Energy efficiency in buildings is very profitable for the society. But it's a very fragmented sector. And if you look at what it means for each individual in that value chain, what's the strength of the lever uh, to change? It is often too small, so therefore it goes very slowly. But from a societal perspective, it's very profitable. So the question is, how do you then deal uh, with that issue uh, if you want uh, to make change uh, happen? How do you translate uh, what, what is profitable to society in a way so it is also uh, uh, triggering actions by individuals and companies? That we haven't figured out uh, at, at uh, uh, this point in time. And it is connected to uh, the financial sector. Because if the financial sector is measuring in one way, and as soon as you meet financial analysts, uh, um, they say, okay, so what's the bottom line? And you say, well, we are actually now pursuing a very sophisticated strategy for sustainability. Well, that's good, but what's, what does it mean on the bottom line? And, and I can tell you that this is a real situation. One of our members is a Spanish company called Acciona. And one of the leaders in, in, uh, in wind, in building sufficiency, and a number of other things. And uh, they had a, a meeting with uh, 150 financial analysts uh, a couple of weeks ago. And they utilized this vision 2050 to spend a couple of hours this explaining the, the strategy that they have for sustainability. <coughs> Response from the financial guys there in the room? Okay. So what does it mean, bottom line? Uh, we have a real challenge here. And, and to me, this is a very serious stumbling block uh, for a future sustainable world. So let me close. Uh, I hope I've been able to illustrate how I see a world which is in transition to sustainability. The drivers for that, the enormous growth, the world which has uh, started to have uh, started a green race and uh, what that means and, and some of the work that we are doing uh, from uh, business uh, to try to uh, deal with that. But we need a better cooperation between governments and business. And I haven't mentioned academia here, but that's, that's another uh, part of, of uh, society uh, where we also need to find ways of working together. Because, as I said before, we need an enormous amount of innovation and transformation. And uh, we haven't been very good at finding the right ways of working between government, uh, between business and academia, you know, academia all the time. And as you heard me say, I'm going to at least make a try personally. Uh, and uh, we need a lot of diplomacy to bring a coherent business voice. The world is going to be resource and corporate constraint, and we have a major role as business. And I think the most important reason why we should do it is that we cannot succeed uh, in a society that fails. Uh, if society is not able to make this transformation to a sustainable world in an orderly way, we will not have good places for doing business. Uh, and, and that's uh, uh, the major driver, I would say, for the global business community, uh, that we have to do what we can uh, to make this uh, a functioning transition uh, to a sustainable uh, 2050. I said that I think it can be done. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be an enormous turbulent transformation in going from where we are today to, uh, uh, to where we need to be. And uh, I had lunch with uh, some of your well, ESPP, I think, uh, 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 younger uh, people working on uh, environmental sciences. Uh, and uh, I said to him, uh, 
given my age, I will uh, retire in the not too distant future, and uh, we hand the world over to you, and I'm not sure we are handing you a very good deal. Uh, you, you will, as the next generation, uh, have a very substantial challenge to take this world forward, to make this transition uh, happen. It can be done, but it's going to be challenging, and it will require a very substantial cooperation with everybody in, in society. So, Tom, uh, that's my, my message. Uh, I don't know if you want to yeah. take some questions or... We have the reception. The reception will be next door at 2. Yes? So we have 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, I'm sure there will be more than a few. So for the, uh, um, the, the next climate treaty after Copenhagen, if we are looking at not a treaty similar to Kyoto, where there's major partic you know, participation of major economies, it's not U.S., but if we are looking at several regional treaties, you're going to be looking at a fragmented policy world, where different countries may have different carbon prices without harmonization of you know, signals, price signals. Then, I mean, how can like big businesses, international corporations, uh, be optimistic about this fragmented world rather than spending efforts to push for a major, major climate treaty involving major economies. So, so what is new? We, we live in a fragmented world with different price signals, different tax systems, different regulatory regimes. Uh, as global companies, we do that every day. That's a world that we are more, that we are very familiar with. We are less familiar with the Kyoto world, with top-down targets set by governments uh, inside the room without any participation by business. I, actually, I can very well see that the world uh, uh, can work in that way, and especially if the world is on a green race. I think that is the strongest driver for uh, creating action. We've had Kyoto now for well over 10 years. I cannot say it stimulated an awful lot of action. But what I see is that the green race is stimulating an enormous amount of action because the true drivers are there. Why is China trying to do this? First, national security. They want to drive energy efficiencies to reduce imports of fuel. Uh, and it's the same thing for the United States. You don't want to send more money to the Arab trip than to Hugo Chavez. Uh, second reason in China, they are nervous that climate change will destabilize agriculture in, a, in, in sensitive areas in China. That means social unrest. Social unrest means a threat to the Communist Party. So climate change equals threat to the Communist Party. Very important driver for China. Uh, the third reason is China is very concerned that the United States and uh, Western Europe will put in border tax adjustments uh, because of different carbon footprints. And that was mentioned a few days ago by uh, John Kerry and Lindsey Graham and, and Lieberman. China has realized that. What they're going to do is that they will introduce a carbon tax in China. And under the WTO, you cannot tax something twice. So if China puts in the carbon tax and pays the tax to themselves, forget it. You can't put, you can't put in a border tax adjustment. And, and uh, 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 the, the fourth thing driving China, uh, China is they want to be the leading exporter, as I said. And this is, these drivers are very similar for the U.S. My, under, my understanding is the U.S. is also concerned about destabilizing agriculture, but primarily in the, in the developing countries. If that means social unrest, it's not a threat to the Communist Party, it's a threat to the U.S. military, because the U.S. military is the only force to stabilize those countries. So, uh, the drivers for a green race are, in my view, very strong. And if those drivers are, are, are being pushed, then we will see real change, real innovation, real deployment of technology and so on, for very good business reasons. Then we have to create some kind of, of common uh, ambition level and make sure that we are heading in the right uh, direction. But I don't think Kyoto is a great example of, of how we should handle this. And when you look at Kyoto, the other thing you have to understand, I was in Kyoto in 1997. 
Apart from Australia that knew what they were doing, none of the other countries had a clue what they agreed to during the last night. That goes for, for uh, Al Gore. Uh, <laughs> no one knew what they agreed to. When they said, I agree to minus 4% or minus 5%, God knows what, they didn't have a clue. Australia had done a very, very serious homework, and they got plus 18 in the negotiations. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I think we, we have to look at new models that can work. Uh, Kyoto did not work, uh, in my view. It triggered an awareness, but it didn't trigger action. <clears throat> Any other question? <clears throat> Given that business, multinational businesses are the leaders in economic activity and have the resources and the technology, why businesses can't substitute Kyoto? We have a multinational conference which leads to uh, voluntary agreement amongst businesses on the direction. So is there agreement in the business community to get on that on their own? Well, um, I mean, first of all, if we were trying to do that, there would be a political uproar. Right? If we were positioning ourselves as uh, uh, trying to be in, in the place of governments, that, that's, that's the first problem that we would be facing. The second thing is that uh, we can only deploy solutions at a certain rate unless it's supported by the right kind of, of policies, uh, uh, regulations and policies and standards. So we are dependent upon government to implement proper frameworks if this is going to work uh, uh, fast enough. There are many, many market failures uh, that won't work just by markets alone. Buildings is one example that I mentioned. Being in, in a core-based state, uh, an, another area where there are market failures are on land transport. Uh, that's why you need the fuel efficiency standards for course, for instance. So uh, we cannot do it on our own. But what we can do is we can tell governments what will, what will work, how far we can go, provided we get X, Y, Z as a proper framework. And that's why there is a need for this dialogue. But business cannot do it, uh, do it alone. And what we also need is to make sure that what we do also is transformed into something that that is profitable for companies, because otherwise you're up against the financial market uh, uh, barrier. I mean, it might make sense for the for society, but it doesn't make sense for companies. And if it's a lost proposition for companies, it will not happen. So this this is something that we have to do together. Uh, the price and market system. <clears throat> I understand it. It can not do it alone, but it certainly has an important role to play. And uh, if it's not working right, if it's interfered with too much, the wrong signals will go out to consumers, households, business who buy, and those who supply energy. So do you have any advice about the price system? Well, I, I, I think definitely we need a price of carbon. Uh, and a tax on carbon or something like that. Yeah, I mean, one can put in a price of carbon in different ways. Uh, I mean, it's not uh, only a tax or uh, a cap and trade. And, uh, yes, yes. Uh, and, uh, uh, but but we, need a, we need a price of carbon. If we believe that carbon emissions is something that we have to manage, we need to have a price. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm saying to my colleagues in business, uh, why would you intentionally screw up your pricing system of your products by not including some of the costs that you have? Why would we screw up the pricing system of society by not putting a price on carbon if that, if that is a cost for society? I, I, and I, uh, I, I think it's definitely uh, needed, and it will come. Uh, I mean, Europe has it for uh, uh, many countries. China is going to put it in. They, they don't believe that they can put in a cap and trade immediately because they simply don't have the data in the system. Therefore, they are going to go via carbon tax with the double benefit that they are trying to prevent you guys from putting in a, a border tax adjustment. Um, but it, we, we cannot live without the carbon price if we want to manage that. Nor can we live without the price of water if we want to manage water. And that brings me to the next question. I mean, carbon is a relatively simple, uniform uh, constraint, which probably we have some mechanisms. But you, you touched on ecological footprint and ecosystem services. 
they are going to be the next bigger constraint, I think. So, if you can't agree on carbon, is there any hope for addressing ecosystem services? Uh, it, it is being addressed. Uh, uh, we have a focus area called ecosystems, and uh, we have developed uh, uh, a system for how uh, you evaluate the ecosystem services impact on companies. Uh, we have developed uh, a, a guide for how you measure ecosystem value of ecosystem services in companies, and it's being road tested now in 17 com uh, uh, companies. And uh, uh, we are uh, working with uh, an initiative uh, uh, set up by the UN to develop uh, uh, in a broader context also the value of ecosystems. So there's a lot of work going on, and we do this in cooperation with, with the Green NGOs. Uh, and I, I think that is in a way easier because the, the carbon issue is so fundamental for competitiveness issues and a number of other issues, and it's become somewhat of an emotional lighting rod. Uh, so pol it, it's more difficult politically than dealing with some of the other issues uh, uh, in my view. But it, it, will have, it will have to be dealt with. Thank you for that very interesting talk. I, I wonder if you could comment a little more on the relationship between uh, government and business as you see it in the United States, for example, compared with uh, Europe and elsewhere. I mean, at the end you called for more cooperation between business and government. There are many in the U.S. who might say that there's a little bit too much cooperation there uh, in that a lot of, uh, you know, we saw it in our recent healthcare debates in terms of how much sway there is um, the corporate interest in, in our government. And what's a healthy and appropriate relationship going forward with this kind of uh, carbon regulation? Because as you mentioned, the goals of the two are not always aligned. Um, yeah. Uh, this works different in different countries. Uh, and uh, uh, my, and I, I'll give you my impression. I mean, the, the U.S. mindset in the business community is a very regulatory mindset. It's basically saying, tell me the rules and I'll deliver. Uh, the, the European mindset is, tell me where you want to go and I'll figure out a way to get there. Uh, and. Uh, uh, the Japanese mindset is government stay out. We are doing it voluntarily. The last thing we want to do is you having any engagement with us. So there are three very different uh, mindsets. And uh, as you live in a regulatory mindset, then influencing the regulatory outcome uh, becomes more important in this country than what it becomes in, in some other countries. So therefore, you have more of lobbying than what you find in Europe or, or Japan, looking at the big uh, uh, economies. And then it's very difficult to say what, what's a reasonable balance. Not seldom it's very accepted that Green NGOs or other civil society activists have a very active uh, uh, involvement. And then when business is trying to make its voice heard, then it's negative lobbying, even if business might be the ones that are, that are affected the most of what is coming out. But I'm, I'm not saying what is right or wrong, but business has certainly on many of these issues a very serious interest. And if you have a country which is regulatory driven, then business must have a right and a role to give its views on this. And then where, does, where do you cross a borderline where you go from expressing that to an, an unhealthy situation, <laughs> talking about health. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I couldn't tell. I'm not uh, knowledgeable enough to, to draw that up. You have to decide, Tom, when you want to. <laughs> yeah, I think this is probably where we should move to the reception. I want to thank Bjorn again for.